and welcome everybody into the Mass and Web Studio. Bobby Blanco, Paul Mancano for the Mass and All Access podcast presented by Marymount University. Visit MarymountSaints.com to learn more about our student athletes and programs today. We are back after a week hiatus. We had a busy week last week covering minor league baseball and minor league playoffs. Um, so we are back this week with full podcasts covering the major league squads. And right at the top of the show, Paul, I have to apologize for my overall appearance and sound. You I, look great. I am a battling a just a god awful head cold. Of course, I get like one of those summer colds right at the end of summer, and yeah. so I am just fighting through. I'm playing through the elements. Don't need a DL stint or IL stint this week. I, I can play through this. It's just a little bang up, but I do sound, and I feel like I look atrocious. You don't look atrocious, Bobby. You've never looked atrocious on this podcast. Oh, thank you. That's uh, way too kind. The, yeah, you can hear a little, little nasal stuff, yeah. but it's better that it happens on September 10th, September 11th, than it happens in three weeks. On October 1st. On October, yeah. Correct. Come, come wild card right. time when you are just, uh, you know, you are in the thick of uh, hopefully a wild card I'm race. doing the standard uh, head cold remedies. Got my night quill, got my day quill, f- plenty of fluids. I got my... Uh, lemon herb tea with you're, some honey yeah you're going the full do you are you an emergency guy i am but i have not to i uh been doing zycam oh, okay yeah yeah kind of the same ish kind of thing but zycam is weird because maybe not weird but like you know how it's like a little tablet and yeah. you just let it dissolve on your tongue you can't like drink for 15 minutes afterwards really anything, which i don't know why you'll explode I, I, yeah it goes straight to your thighs um no i th- I, I guess it's because like you know, you don't want to like wash whatever minerals or whatever it is that's in your mouth like, oh, yeah. like, right away. But like you also can't drink citrus fruits before 30 minutes before or 30 really? minutes after. It's like this whole, you like just one little tablet. You have to plan your whole like diet around, which is kind of crazy. This is this is going to be gross. But I remember um, one of my family members had to have a uh, she won't mind. My mom had to have a surgery. And, or had to have like a scan, like a full body scan or something. And she had to drink something the night before that made her glow. Glow? Yeah. Like so that they could see everything. And uh, our producer, Amy Jennings, is nodding. She knows exactly what we're talking about. But apparently that's a thing. I know that's a little gross. As but if she were like a lightning bug? As if she were like a lightning bug. Interesting. My mom, the lightning bug. All right. Well, yeah, I, I typically am an emergency guy because that's easy. Just a little packet, throw it in a bottle of water the whole thing yeah I've been but just also pounding the orange juice in our in our kitchen oh good stuff good just stuff all that vitamin c um i always just way over drink water like i'm going to the That's bathroom thing, every 15 though. minutes when like you're I'm supposed sick. to like yeah. over like there is such a thing as like, like washing drinking it out. too much water but like you're supposed to like kind of over hydrate when you're sick because like your body's just like deprived of fluid yeah and stuff like well that. i feel sicker just sitting next to you so um, there is a the, there is just imagine there's a wall right here. I'm trying to keep all my germs at this side what, of the podcast table. What was that show? I think it was called Pushing Daisies. In fact, I know the name of it. Never saw an episode. <laughs> what was that show? <laughs> um, but I think it was a British show where like this guy could bring people back to life if he touched them once, but if he touched them again, they would be dead. <laughs> so his wife died, and he brought. I thought it was the coolest concept. Never saw an episode. Really? So his wife died. He brought her back to life by touching her once. And then could never touch her again. Yeah. So they had to like put a brick wall in the car as they were driving. <laughs> I thought it was hilarious, yeah. but not enough to uh, to see an episode. If you've seen Pushing Daisies, is it good? Is it good? Let LMK. Um, well, speaking of that, I wish that uh, Amy Jennings could just like put me in the shoulder to make me not sick. I'm pretty sure she is the one that got me a little sick. She rolls her see, eyes. I don't, I don't know about this. There was a day. Correct me if I'm wrong. There was a day she came in the week. She, she came in last week. She said she wasn't feeling great. Okay. She was coughing a little bit. She was like, I'm not saying she was totally sick, but she right. had something and it just got a little worse when it passed off to me. We did spend four hours in the car you together spent four hours on Friday day, yeah. driving to Delmarva and back, Amy. So that could have been it. And it was chilly that day. I'm not saying it's definitely you, but you didn't help. Let's As I recall, that. Amy that day was like, no, I'm fine. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And then would cough up a lung and then be like, <laughs> yeah. no, no, I'm good. No, I'm not sick. I'm just violently ill. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, I don't know how much blame you can assign to her. I don't know how much control she has over that. Out of 10, I'm giving her like a three on the blame scale. That's okay. not that bad. Not bad I'm not to, like. Also, I've been deprived of sleep. Probably haven't been eating too great just because we've been on the road a couple of times. Took the Redskins loss a little hard. Took the Redskins. My, my fantasy loss to you a little hard. That was ridiculous. That was that, brutal. I think that's I lost seven years of my life that because was just of that fantasy. loss. That's just or that win. That was fun, though. That, that was, was really fun. We've got this um, that's not all accessible studio uh, league set up. All right, but back to baseball. Um, the Nationals, boy, they picked a tough time to start playing. Not great. They, yeah. they went through that stretch, Paul. 
were they went through they went through like a easy schedule. The Orioles and the Marlins they got through that stretch like we predicted they would, winning about uh, what was it like four out of five, playing really good. You know, all, scoring all the runs, all the record setting, uh, scoring ten, multiple games with ten plus runs. Um, they're looking like one of the hottest teams in baseball, and they picked a tough time to start playing as well as they could. Now, whether that's the competition being leveled up or they're just playing. Poorly, I think it's a little bit of a mixture of both, it seems like. Yeah. Um, and now they have this weird interleague game series in Minnesota against a really good Twins team. They only play one team that is not with no, without a winning record the remainder of the way in another three-game series against the Marlins. They're playing contenders the rest of the way. So September schedule is not really favoring the Nationals, but you know, in order to get to the playoffs, you got to beat the best, and you're going to face the best if you get there. Yeah. So September will tell, but, you know, I feel like people were maybe kind of writing off the Nationals as set in stone for that wild card game, especially hosting it, you know, but now that leads down to two and a half. The Cubs are playing a little better. The Diamondbacks are coming out of nowhere. The Phillies are starting to heat up back up again. There's still plenty of baseball to be played. We don't know anything just yet. Yeah. And that, that little dip, I mean, the four, the four games that they faced in Atlanta, those first three, obviously they just could not, seemed to it, they just couldn't seem to get anything going and the four starters for that game for those four games were Freed, Keichel uh at Tehran and who's the fourth one, fourth one uh Soroka so like those are it just show goes to show how dominant uh Atlanta is this yeah. season and how they are clearly the better team you you might have thought it's funny because going into that series you might have thought well maybe the Nats can make up some games in the division and like because if they maybe if they had a four game sweep or something, they would be what f- six five games out. So you thought, okay, maybe they even have like a puncher's chance to win the division. And then you come out of there with your tail between your legs, like let's just get to the wild card. Because yeah. at this point, um, it does help that you have that buffer between yourself and the second wild card. And then there's like another two game drop off. But I mean, it, like you said, that the Phillies are playing better. The Brewers uh, are playing great. Um, it, there is just there's a chance that one of these teams gets hot over the last three weeks and just shoots on up. Um, That being said though, because there are two wild card spots, you feel a little bit better about them just getting in. I mean, you know, I, it's not a set in stone that they will get the first spot. They still have a two and a half game buffer there, but you feel a lot better knowing that, okay, well they, they will at least probably get one of those two spots barring a collapse. They just can't collapse over these last three weeks. Right. And in September baseball, Max Scherzer, we heard on that extra post game show last night being like, you got to win every day. You got to win every day. Every day counts. And it's crazy how much just a week into the schedule or into the month, things can change. Yeah. And, you know, a week ago we were talking about, Hey, all eyes on Atlanta, see if you can trim down this lead and, and get back into this race for the division now flash forward to today and now we're talking about well you got to hold on to the wild card because yeah. you're nine and a half games back in the east your elimination number is nine you know atlanta could probably lock that up within the next week or so yeah um and especially when you know they come to town this weekend and and face a uh, three games against the nationals at Nats park you know they win two out of three of those those are i mean that's that's t- crushing down that elimination number so now you're hoping to hold on to that uh Wild card spot, especially the home field advantage part, the, the first wild card. Again, people, teams are right below you or surging. Nothing is set in stone yet. And you got a tough schedule ahead. And you, we've talked about how the Diamondbacks have an easy schedule. That's why they're kind of surging right now. And, you know, again, they only play the Marlins. You have to go on, you have to finish this road trip to Minnesota. Uh, you've lost six of eight. You, then you have to go to St. Louis. You play five against the Phillies again. Then you play the Indians, who might also be fighting for wild yeah. card positioning near the end of the season. So nothing's going to be easy. Nothing's going to be set in stone until, you know, maybe September 30th. Yeah. Until the last day of this, or 29th, excuse me, the last day of the season. And you've been saying it for weeks, maybe months, that that five-game series against the Phillies is going to be massive. I mean, I, that is probably going to be either the time when the Nats clinch or if for and I think this is far less likely, but unless if they go under in a complete collapse and the Phillies just take advantage of them, yeah. But I think odds are, you know, if they can just get through the next two weeks, I think they're clearly a better team than the Phillies. And if they take on them, if they go into that five game series with at least a couple game lead, I think they'll be fine because I think that they can, for those five games, they can throw five pitchers out there that to a man are better than the five guys that the Phillies will start in those five games. Right. Yeah. And then you can also maybe count on, not count on, but hopefully cross your fingers and expect uh, the teams, other teams behind you, Cubs, Brewers, 
Diamondbacks maybe to slip off a little well, bit yeah, and, and create some space for you. Those teams are all having their problems. The right. last night the Cubs just got uh, just did not play well at all against the Padres. They played terrible defense. The Cubs have low key maybe one of the worst defensive teams. Well, you in lose how he buys for the rest of the remainder of the season. Exactly. Also, Christian Yelich. That's going just down. awful. Uh, obviously, freak it, accident. I mean, yeah. That yeah. affects, obviously, it affects the wild card standings, but it just sucks for baseball. It right. just sucks because he is, if that costs him the MVP, that is going to be real sad because all Bellinger pretty much, they've been neck and neck like yeah. the entire way. And I feel like if Bellinger just has a, a fine last couple weeks of the season, he can lock up. Yeah, the MVP. it might not, might not, it might be now just his t- to lose. To lose, yeah. yeah. Because, you know, the reigning MVP, Yelich, they're, may presumptive, maybe not, but definitely one, two right there. Uh, but, you know, you know again, I mean, I'm not trying to, you know, praise or be happy with what happened to Christian Yelich, but that do- that might open the door for Anthony Rendon to slide into the top two. That's true, or even potentially. Although I think I think I think Yelich, even with without those three weeks, is going to still be a top. You think three so? Guy. Even think missing so. the, the last month of the dude, season, dude hit like thirty eight, three thirty eight. He's got forty four homers or whatever it is. I mean, he has been phenomenal. I think it it does suck that he. Um, had this injury, but I think that the voters will still give him, you know, will acknowledge the kind of year that he had. That being said, though, Rendon has certainly, I mean, he is definitely in the the top. I I, I think, what, at this point, he would probably be either your third or your fourth yeah. and, and LMVP candidate. I think he's, I as the pace he's going, I think he's a lock for a top three. You know how, like, for all the um, awards at the end of the season, at the end of the World Series, they release, like, the top three guys, right. and then they had the big reveal night the last week? I think he's going to be one of those top yeah. three. And, you know, it'll, I, if Yelich were to play out the rest of the season, I would have been like, oh, that's also made the top three. He's definitely going to be third. It's going to be between Bellinger and Yelich. Yeah. But now, I mean, I, I kind of disagree. I, I think if, you know, again, this is not, like, being thankful that Christian Yelich went down, but if you don't play for the last month of the season and Rendon continues the pace that he's at and, you know, surpasses him in home run title, home runs, or or, I don't know where they are in RBIs and keeps his average up, OPS up. I think that there's a legitimate, I mean, you know, the best ability is your availability, correct? So it's like, you know, it's nothing against Yell. It's just what happened. And I I think there is a, I'm not saying it's definitely going to happen, but it's, there's a window for Rendon to slide past him and land number two, maybe even win it if he continues to have a strong September. But that's a conversation for another day. Let's move on to another award that we yeah. wanted to talk about. Um, you know, now that we've gotten that out of the way and the wild card update out of the way, um, the Cy Young, the NL Cy Young is becoming a fascinating race because for the longest time this season, we just assumed that Ryu for the Dodgers was going to run away with it. He had, was having obviously a phenomenal first half of the season, even into July, but he's in a slump now and he's kind of slipping off. And then you also got guys like Max Scherzer who had missed significant time on the IL, uh, I think two IL stints with back problems. Um, and then you got guys like the reigning M- M- uh, Cy Young and Jacob deGrom having strong, another strong season. Mike Soroka for the Braves having a strong breakout season for them. Uh, where do you see how this Cy Young race is going to finish up? Because again, it seemed like it was reused for the taking for the longest time, and now it's just kind of up for grabs. Yeah, well, there are four names that you mentioned there that I think those four are probably the most likely candidates to get the, the final three spots. If there are people you think we're missing, I've heard Jack Flaherty. I've heard uh, even if Steven Strasburg, let us know. But uh, th- I think at this point, if somebody is an amazing September, maybe we'll change that. But those four, Scherzer, Ryu, Soroka, and DeGrom, it is kind of crazy. DeGrom, obviously, he has a, 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 an ERA that is a full run better than it was last year, and it's still a 2.7, yeah. and he still pro- might not get 10 wins. Yeah, He still is 9-8 and eight this year. Just tragic what they are doing to that man there. Um, it, yeah, in, in terms of, it's interesting because, look, the, the whole Cy Young race over the past, what, 5, 10 years has totally shifted because of the the decreased innings pitched by all of these guys. So when you so Max Scherzer goes out there and typically he wants to go deep into games, he missed several weeks of the season. In in a, a season maybe five or ten years ago, that might have killed a guy's Cy Young chances. Right. But the fact that they're not asking Ryu to go too deep in games, they're not asking Mike Soroka to go too deep in games. These guys aren't throwing three hundred pitch innings a year, two hundred fifty. These guys on this list have 154, 161 
the the highest on this four person list is Jacob Degrom with 183. So it, these guys are all right around the same area, and then it's just kind of splitting hairs with these yeah. four guys because you can find any one stat to make your case for any one of these four guys. It just depends on which stats do the voters value at the end of the day. Yeah, DeGrom is probably the only one that's gonna has a chance to break 200. Yeah, and like we said last year, we saw Max Scherzer pitch, I believe, 300. Or close to close, it. Uh, yeah, or several no, years two, ago. Well, yeah. he got to 300 strikeouts. 300 yeah. strikeouts, and then... But yeah, the, the the innings are just super down. And we talked about this last year, too, in this in this debate with the Cy Young. You know, Max Scherzer's innings were way higher than Jacob DeGrom's, but Jacob DeGrom still had the numbers across the board in other areas yep. that allowed him to walk away with it. So, yeah, where do voters value innings? I mean... Well, my yeah, my my thing is the strikeouts. How do vote, voters value strikeouts in terms of uh, correlation with the innings? Well, yeah, that that too, and and K's per nine because this is this is a four person list that you have two guys on these on this list that have ridiculous strikeout numbers, yeah, and the other two are mediocre, at, or you know, slightly above average in terms right. of strikeouts, and uh, the the two ridiculous ones being Scherzer and Degrom, and Degrom, and the and the other two in Ryu and Soroka have just modest strikeout numbers. So right. how do voters value the strikeout? Because obviously we saw Scherzer get 300 strikeouts last year, which would be, I mean, 10, 15 years ago, that would be mind bo- not mind-boggling. It would be mind-boggling that he wouldn't win the Cy Young because of that, right. because of how those strikeout numbers have ballooned over the past however many years. But how do voters, are voters going to look at these four guys and say, all right, Max Scherzer has almost... 13 strikeouts per nine. Jacob deGrom has uh, almost uh, 11.36 strikeouts per nine. And then you have two guys who have, Ryu has eight strikeouts per nine, and Soroka who has seven. Yeah. I mean, those numbers are staggeringly different. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and uh, but going back to the conversation we had last, I mean, we also talked about how, you know, do the voters, because Max kind of blew away, he had more strikeouts and more innings than Degrom last year, and that that proved not to matter. Yeah. So is it is it a year by year cases, or is it a trend that we're seeing that voters are less likely or don't care as much about the innings and the strikeouts than they do? Because like we, like we said, Ryu strikeouts isn't Ryu's game. Like that's not how he gets guys. He gets guys out by getting ground balls and and pitching low in the zone and, and getting outs that way. Max Scherzer and Jacob Degrom live by the strikeout. So. If he, if Ryu was and he had his obviously the super low ERA, I mean his ERA by the months were ridiculous. He had an ERA under one in both May and July this season. Um, but if Ryu was the favorite for the most of the season, and now obviously take away his slump, you know he wasn't blowing guys away with strikeouts. You know he that's not how, that's not his game. So voters must not be looking at these numbers as often or as or as or putting putting enough emphasis or significance on them that we believed because he was the favorite and he was like you said the numbers show he doesn't really strike people out right and i look back to cuz i think ultimately when you judge a pitcher i would say probably at this point you say era still despite all that you know you have whip you have strikeouts you have all this other kind of stuff but i think at this point I think you would agree, Bobby. ERA is still like the defining quality because yeah. it is runs allowed. I mean, that is that is literally just like the the pitcher's job is to not allow runs. Right. So, you know, a guy who has the higher or higher ERA, it, it just has a huge advantage over those guys. I look back to 2016, which was Max Scherzer's first year with the Nationals, first time he won a Cy Young um, with the Nationals. He had he came so he he finished in first, had 91% of the Cy Young votes that year. He had a 2.96 ERA, closer to three. And the guys below him on that list, almost the next five, four or five guys, all had lower ERAs than Max. Mm -hmm. Next guy was Lester. He had a 2.44. Hendricks for the Cubs had a 2.13. Bumgarner had a 2.74. And Clayton Kershaw had a 1.69. Kershaw struggled with injuries that year, so he only pitched 150 innings. But Scherzer had the higher ERA, but he had ridiculous strikeout numbers. So that year, voters clearly valued his strikeout numbers, and he pitched a lot of innings, so he pitched 220-some innings. So that, that was more of a value. 
he still gave up more home runs than a lot of these guys. He gave up 31 homers. He walked more guys than any of the other guys in this list. So what do voters value? Uh, uh, you know, if, if yeah. they were going to go by this metric, you might say Scherzer because he is striking out a ridiculous number of people, even though he might, you know, not have quite the ERA that these other guys have. Or are they just going to look at kind of what they looked at last year and said, look, best best ERA, your job as a, uh, as a pitcher is to not allow runs. Are we going to give this to Hyunjin Ryu because he has the lower ERA? Right. And I, that goes back kind of my question I was trying to pose earlier. It's like, is this a trend that we're seeing or a right. year-by-year basis? I yeah. think it's a year-by-year basis. And, like, what's the bar for this year? Well, the bar this year is going to be Hyunjin Ryu and his low ERA. And the same was last year with Jacob deGrom, his low ERA. You go back to that season, it was the strikeouts because Max just blew people away with his strikeout numbers. doesn't matter if he had a young, a smaller ERA. He, his strikeout numbers were just too big to ignore to not give him the award. So now, now I feel like it's a year-by-year basis. The voters are going to look, all right, what is... You know, for lack of a better phrase, what's hot this year, or what's you know what's sexy this year? That year sucks. That were sex strikeouts were sexy, right? That's the whole T-shirt campaign that the Nationals made <laughs> this year. Like last year, it might be ERA because you know, like you said, the whole pitcher's job is to not allow runs. Yeah, and and but that also might be to Max Scherzer's benefit because again, his ERA is pretty low. They all have kind of similar. No one, yeah, they're because all, again, Ryu's slump. He's his ERA has jumped the whole run. Uh, it was down to, I believe, 1.45, and now it's up to 2.45. So they're all kind of within the same area, and I'm looking up at some other write-ups, and now Max Scherzer leads the NL in ERA+. Plus. So that could be to his advantage, too, some of these other sabermetric numbers, along with the strikeouts, even though he doesn't might not have the innings pitched. Right, and uh, you mentioned that, that Ryu drop-off. I mean, he was dominant to start the season, and you brought up the numbers in August and September. What are his ERAs over those past two months? August we got seven point four eight in this month in September. Only two starts, but six point two three, and he's being skipped to start to get some rest. And Dodgers right. are, are concerned that he's pitching too much, and they're well, one trying to save his arm for the postseason, obviously, but two, you know, he's never pitched this much in, in, in a season before. He's always been, I believe, injured, and so therefore getting some rest by yeah. being on the injured list or the the formerly DL list. But he, he, I think he only had one trip this year, and it was a very brief stint. Like, they missed one start. So now he's pitching more than he ever has, and he, his arm's getting kind of worn out. And yeah. they're trying to, you know, the Dodgers, having lost two straight World Series, first team to clinch this season already in the postseason, they're probably looking more towards a World Series championship than just making sure this guy gets the side young. Yeah, and I think as we have seen him dip also – We've started, the, then the cracks start to show in terms of his Cy Young case because then you say, all right, well, also his he's <laughs> striking out five fewer guys per nine innings than Max Scherzer is. And also uh, his whip is still, is just eighth in the National League. Mm-hmm. It's not like he's, you know, uh, not giving up a ton of hits as well. Um, then the, the cracks really start to appear uh, elsewhere in terms of his, his Cy Young case. And then that really opened the door for Max Scherzer. I thought for sure... Scherzer was out of it when he missed the yeah, time. Yeah, I did too, actually. I thought this was going to be the end for his run. Yeah. Or and, th- for this year. Um, and, and now that these cracks have started to appear, you started to see Scherzer get back into it. My question for you, Bobby, because now it, we're, we're looking at the stats here. Scherzer is better. He, he has a slightly worse ERA, but he is better in strikeouts per nine. He is uh, first in the National League in, in Ks per nine. He's second in whip. Also, by the way, Zach Renke would still be on this list if he hadn't gotten traded to the to the oh, Astros. Right. He yeah. was having an awesome year yeah. um, with the Arizona Diamondbacks. So <laughs> Scherzer is still second in whip to Zach Renke. Sorry, Grenk. Uh, you're not going to get that. Um, and he is second in ERA to Ryu with a 2.56 ERA. He has thrown eight more fewer innings, so um, down in that category. But look, Ryu has him beat in only one major stat, and that's ERA. ERA. If you had to decide between these two guys right now, if you're a voter, who would you go with? I think. And also, would you give any of the other guys a list? Soroka, DeGrom being the other two. I think, um, I think I I might have to go max because that ERA difference isn't as big. You know, if if Ryu's ERA was back down to 1.45 or under 2 at some point, I think that's too hard to ignore, the only guy being under 2 ERA. But now, you know, they're only 0.11 points apart. 
that's not that much of a window. Oh, man, it's a tricky question, Paul, because then you also got to take in the fact that, well, but also Scherzer has pitched, let's see, well, only seven less innings. Yeah, it's exactly. That's crazy. That it's tough. So it? Ryu doesn't, I mean, Ryu, I think Ryu is, he is on pace to probably, well, they've pushed back to start, but he's on pace to match his career high in starts, which is 30 back in his rookie year, mm-hmm. back in 2013. He's, his next highest is 26, and that's what he's at right now. Um, so he's on on pace to pitch the most innings or most games he's pitched since his rookie year, and yet he's only pitched seven more innings than a guy who missed a whole month. Yeah. The other question. So that he's not getting. So he's been struggling getting deep and in, deeper into games. Yeah. Yeah. Look at that. One more thing I want to throw at you before you have to make your decision. And Max also hasn't been pitching deeper into games by design. Yeah. Yeah. Is war. I don't know how much you count in terms of. I I, I look at it more for position players. I'm not as sure how it because it, Mike Miner is still like leading baseball in pitcher war which doesn't make sense to me even yeah. though he doesn't have a great he's got like a 3-5 ERA um, Scherzer but it is another category that I'm sure especially the younger more sabermetric minded voters will take into account Max Scherzer's war this year by fan graphs is 6.2 by baseball reference it is 6.0 Hyunjin Ryu by fan graphs his, ER, his war is 4.1 and his baseball reference war is also 4.1. So, so he's got to beat by two wars. I don't know. Yeah, two games. <laughs> 2.0, yeah, two, wins. Two wins. Two wins. Two, two, wins. Two, two wins. So if I mean on September 11th, 2019, if I'm looking at just these stats numbers, like if you're doing that yeah. bit where you're just like, you're here are two stat lines, pick which one you Yeah, would, erase the names. Right. I have to go with Max. Yeah, I, I think, think so too. I think I have to go with Max. Again, the ERA is close enough. The innings are close enough. And then the K per nine is just so much different. And the whip's close enough. And then you go add those numbers that the war is, you know, Max is worth two more wins than Ryu at this point. Yeah. And Ryu's on a better team. Yeah, exactly. That's the thing. It's, yeah. <laughs> you know, you, some with MVP, I'm sure, you know, it has traditionally been, oh, well, you know, he's on the better team. He's well, we saw last year that playoffs. DeGrom was on a much worse team. And yeah. he... he I mean, that's part of the reason, and that, that also might be in DeGrom's favor, that, you know, he plays, or he's pitching in front of one of the worst defenses in baseball, yeah. and he still has numbers like this. Yeah, I would also definitely count out Soroka. I think he's going to be a great young pitcher. Um, that being said, I still don't think he has, he's kind of like, you know, on the outside looking in, kind of like Aaron Nolan. It's like, great, great job for your first breakout year, right. but, you know, not quite there in terms right. of the other stats. DeGrom, I think, deserves to be in the top three. I think that he is the fact that he is the most innings pitched and still has a 2.70 ERA. The fact that he is almost, uh, you know, to Scherzer's level in terms of strikeouts per nine. The fact that he is third in the National League in whip. I would put DeGrom in the top three and I would put Ryu in second and I would give it to Max Scherzer yeah. at this point. Obviously, three there's weeks a month, left. Yeah, there's one left to play. I, I also, DeGrom, I think he's been like the model of consistency. That's why he gets in there. Yeah. He's, you know, again, he's been available. 29 stars. He's going to probably get around 35 starts this season. You know, knock on wood, he, nothing happens injury-wise for the remainder of the season for him. Uh, you know, a guy who's been able to consistently put up those numbers for the entire season and not miss any time, I think that has to give you some some points yeah. to get into the top three. And I'm pretty sure at one point, DeGrom had like a or an ERA close to five. He was struggling to start the year, kind of the opposite of Ryu. He's really turned it on in the last few months. Um, it, it, yeah, at one point he started out March and April with a, a 4.85 ERA. And then every month since then he's been sub three. So, yeah. um, it, with the exception of a couple starts in, in September so far. So I think he's in the top three, but I agree with you at this point, ER, the, e, the difference in ERA between Ryu and Scherzer is not enough to give it to, to, to Ryu in my opinion. Yeah. I think you go across the line, like, and even add Jacob deGrom in this mix, you know, they're all kind of the same in you know, ERA, Jacob Grams is a little higher. Um, what, where's the biggest difference? Yeah. And what stat is that? And it's K's per nine, and it's huge. Yeah. It's, 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 a, it's a major difference. Now, between Scherzer and DeGrom, it's not that big. And DeGrom has way more innings, so that conversation might be even more interesting than Scherzer versus Ryu, just because DeGrom has the innings, also the strikeouts, but then Scherzer's ERA is that much more better, though, too, yeah. as well. So that's, that's also another conversation to have. Yeah. Well, this is a jumping off point for another conversation about another national starter, Mm -hmm. Steven Strasburg, who has made some headlines in the past week. Nothing he's done, but some reports that have come out. One big one from JP Morosi with MLB.com and MLB Network. 
talking about uh, Max Scherzer's opt-out, which has flown under the radar. We've mentioned it a few times on this podcast. Max Scherzer is an opt-out on his contract after this season. He's got another one. If he opts in after this season, he's got another one next season as well. But this one, apparently he is, quote, increasing. It is a an increasing possibility that he will opt out, according to J.P. Morosi. Right. Uh he, there are four years left on his deal, $100 million. A lot of that money is deferred, apparently $70 million in deferred payments to be paid in annual installments of uh, $10 million from 2024 to 2030, according to Colts baseball contracts. So, at this point, Steven Strasburg is now a candidate to opt out, and that is a concern <laughs> for yeah. the Nationals front office, it wouldn't you be. say? Yeah, it definitely should be. I mean, he picked a hell of a season to have his best – year in a long time and be injury free. Yeah. I think that's the biggest thing. He'd proved he could be durable at this time. And, and we talked about earlier in the season, how he kind of changed up his approach. You know, he's not relying too much on his heater anymore. He's kind of laying off. So is to kind of rest his arm and in finding different ways to get guys out. Yeah. It's a major concern. And it's something that's kind of flown on the radar, like you said, because of well, one, how poorly the national started off the season and two, you know, They've gotten back into it, and it, and and they've got hot for the second half. We've been one of the best teams in baseball since the end of May. And then also three, Max Scherzer has dealt with injuries, and then all the concern about him and trying to get him back and get healthy. So this is definitely flown on the radar for them and for Nationals fans. I mean, he's I think he's earned it. I think he deserves that right. He does not strike me. If you're asking me right now, I'll go on the record right now and say I believe he's back next year because he does not strike me as a guy that – wants to bail or you know we, we saw when was it 2015 16 what it was when he re-signed the extension you know he, he's not he's not a Bryce Harper type he does not want to test the free agent waters he, he, he doesn't like that attention he doesn't want it he's comfortable here he likes it here let's see how far the Nationals get in the postseason too that could also play an effect you know if they finally win a division series or if they you know or if they come just short again um, he doesn't strike as a, he doesn't strike me as a guy that wants to go through that process with all the intention, the free agent process. He might, though, however, opt out and then use this season to reconstruct, reconstruct, reconstruct another deal yeah. with the Nationals. That, that was a possibility also mentioned in that article is that he could at least use it as leverage to get a higher payday right. with the Nationals. Maybe instead of having two opt outs, you re-sign for another three years with right. a higher AVV. Which is AAV. is interesting because the Nats this year, I think that they have at least attempted, and I would guess that they have succeeded in sneaking under the luxury tax yeah. so that they reset the clock because right. then it's now no longer a 50% penalty. Um, so they might have a little bit more leeway to spend in the offseason. They have another free agent by the name of Anthony Rendon oh, yeah. that... Uh, my guess is they still want to keep, despite uh, the fact that he still has not signed a deal. I think he is still one of their top priorities, if not their top priority. Mm -hmm. So the question becomes, how much of a priority is Max Scherzer? And will this... Max Scherzer? If, Max, sorry, Steven Strasburg. If Steven Strasburg attempts this leverage play to try to get a bigger deal with the Nationals, will it work out? Because will the Nats be willing to open up the checkbook and pay for their former number one overall pick? <laughs> I think they owe him that, at least, to look into it. You know, I, I would Definitely. agree that Rendon takes precedent here. You got to lock him up long term. You could even throw in Juan Soto and Victor Robles into this. And, like, you know, go the Braves route and sign them up long term now Just as opposed to waiting it because you don't want them testing the free agent waters down the line. But, yeah, Steven, I mean, again, I think there's a lot of time to be played out in Mike Rizzo's, if, you know, if, this was brought to Mike Rizzo's attention right now. Or you've asked him right now. I feel like he's going to say the same things. We have time to figure this out. Let's yeah. see. We're not focused on that right now. Let's focus on the season. Yeah, definitely. Because a lot can change. Like I said, he's been injury prone his entire career, except for this season. He's proven that he's been durable. So can he maintain that? I mean, God forbid, what if something happens down the stretch where he's forced to miss the playoffs or he misses a start here or two in September? That changes the whole conversation, you know? So I, I think the Nationals... And Steven Strasburg have a, a good relationship, a great relationship. The team that drafted him, that brought him up, that has done stood by him and done him right all the way through his career, you know, shutting him down in 2012. We're not having this conversation if they run him out there in 2012. So the, 
his agent, Stephen, Shru- uh, excuse me, uh, Scott Boris has a good relationship with the learners and Mike Rizzo. This is something that, yeah, could he be asking for too much money down the line? I mean, he's also what on the wrong side of thirty with options. I, again, I just it's don't tough. think it is tough. But I, I, I don't think he strikes me as a person that's gonna or a player, excuse me, that wants to at this point in his career just completely change and pick up and, and move. True. However, we did kind of say that about Anthony Rendon. He hasn't done anything like yet. He that's hasn't bolted yet. Slightly different because he now Anthony Rendon is what twenty six, twenty seven. He's a little older than that. He's 29, I think. I think he's, I think he's is he? But so. in the prime of his career, also a position player, not a pitcher. True, true. And so. and has dealt with far less uh, right, injury right. issues than, uh, yeah, he's 29. 29, okay. But either way, I, 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 I'm, if you're asking me now, I think Strasburg comes back. They rework his deer. You also think about, you know, they're going to have to rework Ryan Zimmerman's deal. He's probably going to come. I'm going to assume yeah. he's going to come back for way less money. Uh, that opens up some space. You know, we'll see what happens with Anthony Rendon. You know, because also, if you don't get Rendon, then Strasburg becomes your priority to lock him Absolutely, up and yeah. definitely just restructure this deal and keep him for the next, you know, three or four good years he has left, probably. At also, I know Scott Boris is not the most popular person uh, in D.C. or yeah. in baseball in general, yeah. but. I will say this was a pretty pretty smart move by Boris to the design and structure of this contract. He basically signed it, knowing you know, with the possibility that Strasburg could get better. Uh, you know, he could have a year like this either in 2019 or 2020, and use that leverage to get more money yeah. or just opt out and get more money on the free agent market. And what if he hits that free agent market? What are the other pitchers out there? Then not much. There are not much. I think if you drop him, so I looked up the list of free agent pitchers for next year. If you drop Matt, uh, Steven Strasburg, I keep saying Max Scherzer, into that list. We did talk about him for a good amount of time. Yeah, we did. I think suddenly Steven Strasburg is the th- maybe uh, the third best pitcher on the starting pitcher on the market, and you can make a case he's higher than that. The only other two guys I see better than him on the market right now are Madison Bumgarner, who is phenomenal, as we know, and still old, not that old. I mean, we were talking about him with the Nationals potentially trading for him because I thought, well, this guy's got to be super old. He's not. He's yeah. like 30, yeah. 29. Uh, and Garrett Cole, who is absolutely phenomenal uh, on the right side. I think he's 28. So, you know, those two guys, I think, probably have better resumes than Steven Strasburg and um, certainly better injury histories than Steven Strasburg. But the way that this market has gone... Well, that's the other question I was going to bring up, too, yeah. Uh, because... Why would you want to hit the free agent market? You, yeah. It, it, on, and Especially we, as a pitcher. And we just one, saw what Dallas Keuchel and, yeah. and, and Craig Kimball was a reliever, but we saw what they went through this past season. Yeah. And, and you know, uh, Scherzer has not had the kind of like the... Or Strasburg has not had the dip in terms of like the secondary statistics that... Uh, a Dallas Keuchel has had. Right. He's he he had a great. He's having a great career year at just the right time. And uh, like you said, Bobby, it's his first really fully healthy year since 2014. He has hit uh, a w- career high in wins with 16. He's got 185 innings pitch, which is his most since 2014. He's got a 3.5 ERA. He's got 222 strikeouts, which is second in the National League. And he's got 29 starts as of right now, which is the most since 2014. He had this year at the absolute perfect time. He yeah. could have it again next year, um, you know, and also have it a good time because of the opt out after that year. But he had this at the perfect time to hit a free agent market. But you know, how how much are teams going to value a guy who has a crazy injury history, who is on the wrong side of 30, right. um, in, a, in a market where suddenly starting pitchers are not nearly as valuable as they used to be? I think that becomes even the bigger question now. Why would you want to hit the free agent market if you don't yeah. absolutely have to? Exactly. Know? And this is also, this conversation goes out the window if, for whatever reason, Stephen Trustberg decides to pick up his option. He's like, yeah, I'll come back for whatever month money I'm owned, owed next year. Um but yeah, I, I think the way I the way I see this playing out is especially looking at the stats you just ran through his career highs and in, in wins, uh, the most innings in 2014. You know, I see this if not the picking up the option, which I seems unlikely because he'll probably want more money, but a slight pay increase, restructure the deal, mm-hmm. restructure the deal for a couple more years, add make it like a three year deal with a high annual average, and then also that's 
filled with incentives. You know, you match if you you get this amount of money if you win this many games. You get this amount of money if you uh, hit this many innings, this many strikeouts, whatever. And that's going to be the – and also, we've seen he's okay with deferred money. So a lot of deferrals. A right. lot of deferrals and then incentive-based. Right. So that could be something that will be both beneficial for Steven Strasburg that he will want to feel like he's getting paid fairly and want to mm-hmm. stay, and also beneficial for the Nationals to – keep their finances in line where they feel like they're not being, you know, shelling out too much to one pitcher while also trying to keep a few other key parts of their roster. Yeah. Obviously I know that we are at least, you know, a month and a half away from free agency in the full off season, but much like last year, the Nats are going to be right in the center of the winter meetings when we go to San Diego, which, by the way, happens to be Steven Strasburg's hometown. Correct. Just like how Bryce Harper, Bryce Harper in, Vegas. in Las Vegas. Good Lord. Uh, yeah, this is going to be fun. But it's it's going to be a fascinating offseason. Nats are going to be right in the middle of it because now they could have, in theory, two top free agents. They could have the best third baseman on the market, and they could have the third best starting pitcher on the market. Uh, and, and, you know, we're going to have all the same questions that we had last year. Are they going to be able to address the other needs while they have these guys that are sitting on the market? Like with last year, they went out and signed Patrick Corbin, even though they had Bryce Harper, who had still not signed a deal. So how are they going to deal with that? What is the timeline of both of these guys? And the other factor, they're dealing with the same agent with both these guys. Right. And, you know, Steven Strasburg seems more of like a, a team player to me. Like, like w- does the Anthony Rendon thing affect his decision at all? Like, what if the Nationals right. like, hey, we're... We're going to lock up Tony, too. And then we're probably going to go after Soto and Robles. We want you to stick around. He'd be like, yeah, I'll stick around. I'll be I'll be the number right. two man out of this three-headed monster of a rotation with these young superstars locked up for the yep. rest of my career. Yeah, <laughs> I'll, I'll play with a contender for the rest of my career. And the only town I know that has treated me nothing but with nothing but love for my entire career. It's a good case. We don't really know. We can't get inside his head, obviously. No, we can't. And, he, and he doesn't. Even for all the years that he's been in this organization, I don't think there are too many people from a media side that would say they know him terribly well. Yeah. It, it is kind of a, not a shame, but it's like odd. It's weird that this is now coming off the heels, like you mentioned, Paul, of the Bryce Harper story last year. Yeah. But I, I really think, and you know, I, I know I was on record saying last year that I think Bryce would want to stay, staying in D.C. would be his first choice. And he, uh, apparently he came out and said that, you know, he was close to accepting that deal from the Nationals yep. and thought he was going to be a National for life. But I really think that in terms of Steven Strasburg right here, what we're talking about, and then also adding Anthony Rendon, these are two; these are different animals. They're not a Bryce Harper, you know. They don't like the attention like Bryce does. They don't want; they're not in it for it. They want to be paid fairly, you know. They they want to be paid fairly and treated right and have an opportunity to win more so than you know. They want the most money. They want the most an, average annual value. Yada yada yada. What the years that Bryce wanted last year that came out after he signed with the Phillies. So I think these are. I, I think Nationals fans are concerned maybe a little bit or like kind of feel a little heartbroken still or still feeling the effects of that Bryce Harper storyline from last year. I would say that we can treat these two completely separately because differently, because I think they are slightly different mental attitudes completely towards, agree. towards the whole free agent process too. Completely agree. Bryce Harper was certainly a special case. Yeah. Yeah. The chosen one. Never forget. Mm-hmm. All right, Paul. Well, that was a good conversation. Good to be back with you in the Mass and All Access web studio talking Nationals baseball in the Mass and All Access podcast presented by Marymount University. Visit Marymount Uni- Mar- Mar- MarymountSaints.com to learn more about our student athletes and programs today. Be sure to follow the Mass and All Access podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Play, and SoundCloud. And you can check us out on the Mass and Nationals Facebook page, Mass and All Access Facebook page, and Mass and Nationals YouTube and Twitter accounts. For Paul, I'm Bobby. We'll catch you next time.